Um, very happy to be in uh, Dublin for the very first time in my life. Oh, okay. uh, very happy to be also um, in 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 uh, in the room with you all, uh, and happy that it's it's this setting actually because I would like to engage in a conversation. Uh, I will uh, try to give you some of the basic thinking back in Brussels. Um, and in general on connectivity, a little bit then more detail on what EU is doing. We'll try to keep it rather short if possible because it's a huge theme, because um, I would um, value your questions very much. I think this is always the best, the best way to, um, to carry a, a conversation by um, getting questions um, and, and, and suggestions. And um, I'm always, you know, I do a lot of outreach because this is a complex and, and comprehensive but an important uh, new, if you wish, policy framework. And every time I try to explain what connectivity is, because it's a different thing to different people, you know, some think it's only digital, some think it's only railways, some think, <laughs> Uh, every time I sort of upgrade the explanation <laughs> of what it is um, and, and use the, the picture of EU being a result of connectivity. We, we became who we are because we embraced connectivity as the logic of, of our development. But then when I was landing last night, I thought it would be easier to explain connectivity in Ireland. I think you have an inner uh, understanding of the importance of being connected or, or uh, the disadvantage uh, if, the connect, if the connectivity is not, is not uh, within your reach. Uh, as I said, European Union itself uh, became what it is because it embraced connectivity <coughs> as, the main, as the main logic of things. And we took it for granted. This is something that we do, and uh, inside Europe, definitely, and many elements of it outside of Europe. But only recently, connectivity as such became one of the key issues that are discussed, and I think is going to be one of the key policy trends of our century. And there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, first, that connectivity itself is not value neutral. So connectivity comes with a set of norms and standards that project the values we believe in, like sustainability or transparency or just just diff different uh, different standards that we we cherish and we think are is important um, uh, in that sense. And it very quickly translates into a system. So what we are talking about here is a system of values, rules, and norms that project who we are. Uh, being that, it by definition has security implications. There are a number of security issues that, that uh, are opened through the discussion on connectivity from a global threat of climate change and what will happen to us if we will not look into sustainability of different connectivity investments, etc., to 5G, to uh, the question of, uh, of our sovereignty in terms of, um, of supply chains, um, to resilience of developing countries. So there are a number of sort of security elements that we have to think about when we talk about connectivity. And then also there are very important economic elements to the discussion on connectivity in terms of our own economic benefits and possibilities to the opportunities that it creates for developing countries. We live in a world where today, if you invest in the right 
sector, if you wish, or in the right uh, kind of connectivity, developing countries can jump a generation. So we're not talking about um, uh, potable water anymore. We are not talking about basics. We're talking about teaching kids the skills for the new century. And this is where you can really help a country simply jump something that 20 years ago was, was impossible. We have to be very careful because we don't want to risk by not investing, creating even larger, larger divide between the developed and non-developed non ones. Um, the needs for connectivity out there are really amazing. We uh, are reading, of course, uh, a lot of research papers, and there are some predictions that in the next 40 years, more will be done for connectivity than in the history of humankind because of technology and the changes that technology will bring in the way we connect and we share our common space. Uh, we can't even, I think, imagine half of it now. <laughs> So it's very important for us to be able to really think and plan uh, not one but two generations ahead in terms of what is, what is going to happen. And then just in, in plain monetary uh, terms, um, there are predictions that annually, and these are very conservative predictions, globally at least two trillions are needed to catch up. These are really conservative ones. For Asia alone, by 2030, 26 trillion dollars, I think, for, for, for the needs and connectivity that they have. The second reason why we're looking at this in, a, in this comprehensive way are the challenges that we are facing. One I already mentioned, these are enormous needs, but also new kind of needs. Uh, today, it's much easier to see what good life or the quality of life looks like. Uh, I'm told that in many parts of the world, I mean, there is hardly a bulb, but there is, everybody has a mobile. And they figure out how to, they find ways to, to get connected, etc. So, you know, the, it, it's instant. And your need becomes much more pronounced and, much, and much, uh, much more political, if you wish, because the political elites have to cater for the, for the needs of, of, of the people. And this are, uh, these are the needs that I think we partly failed to see and failed to understand. Uh, and we have to say China was much uh, quicker in understanding that uh, sophisticated new infrastructure, uh, that this is what countries in development really want, uh, and not just a roof above their head. So um, in, in that sense, uh, we, we still have some serious um, work to do in understanding and analyzing. Uh, the second thing I already mentioned, uh, and it's a real challenge, is the incredible um, pace of the technology change. If you think artificial intelligence, if you think Internet of Things, if you think what is uh, coming our way and also uh, possibilities for these technologies to become disruptive at one point, the need to regulate, uh, this is something that needs to be, to be discussed. And also I think understanding that those who will be the leaders in regulation will be the leaders in the world as well. Uh, because this will be what, what defines the world. And then finally, the new rivalries that are stemming from this, uh, this connectivity uh, slash system um, discussion, especially the standoff between US and, and, uh, and China is a challenge to, is a challenge to, to everyone because uh, the global markets are so intertwined that it's very hard to fathom that they can separate. So we have to find a way of being interoperable. We have to find a way of working together and finding some kind of common denomination in, in, in certain uh, key, key junctures. Uh, and in a way, it's, it's interesting how the discussion on connectivity 
brought up uh, to everyone uh, like the fact that multilateralism is a question of common sense because I don't know how else can you, can you find a solution if not through multilateral engagement approach and agreement. And then finally for the EU, uh, why this is very much on our agenda, because of what I believe are some incredible capacities that European Union has, which um, have not been uh, either pronounced well enough or visible uh, at, in, in the way they should be. There is clearly uh, a bit of a gap between these capacities and, and, and the projection or the visibility of them. And I'll just give you a few, few numbers and I think you will immediately understand what I'm talking about. So 56% of global uh, ODA, so development assistance, is provided by European Union and its member states. In the last budget cycle, the amount of ODA that EU and its member states have disbursed equals, or is a little bit bigger, than the amount of loans that were disbursed through BRI. Very few see it that way, but that's the fact. These are the OECD numbers and, and the World Bank numbers, so this is, this is what is out there. Um, European Union um, provides the largest portion of uh, foreign direct investment. We are, I'm pretty sure, probably the most sophisticated, we have probably the most sophisticated system of governance of differences because this is what EU sort of uh, regulatory framework is. We learned how to find a solution for differences among our, our member states and have uh, have a top-notch sort of regulatory system. We are leading in many technologies, in renewables. We are leaders in, in a number of uh, a number of sectors, and we have a very deep financial pool. When you look at the capital markets and what is available out there for investment, at this very moment on the EU markets, it's around 15 trillion euros. That should be put to good use. Uh, so what our task now is really to put all this together uh, into a coherent, comprehensive and strategic action in the way we, uh, we use uh, all, these, uh, all these capacities and how in interaction with the recipient countries, we create a new value both for them and, and for us. Uh, in practical terms, how European Union responded. Um, in October 2018, uh, Council adopted uh, the strategy called Connecting Europe and Asia, a building block for an EU strategy. It started from Asia because this Euro-Asian space, if you wish, uh, is, is a huge potential that is still untapped. 70% um, of world population lives there. It generates 60% of global GDP. So you can imagine, I mean, we're talking about huge numbers here uh, that still need to be uh, explored much more. Uh, the strategy itself can be summarized, I always say, 432. There are four pillars, three work strands through which we want to implement, and two basic principles. Four pillars are transport, energy, digital, and human connectivity. Three work strands uh, are building physical infrastructure, securing finances, and working in partnerships and two basic principles, the principle of sustainability, be it fiscal, economic, environmental, or social sustainability, and a level playing field so that all businesses have same, absolutely same conditions for competing on in connectivity projects. 
there are some very important decisions to be made in 2020. The first one is uh, MFF, so the next budget for the EU, uh, where uh, there is a discussion on the so-called EFSD Plus Fund, or European Fund for Sustainable Development, which uh, in essence, just to simplify, is an external investment guarantee facility where uh, those businesses who that want to go into, into uh, developing uh, countries get additional reassurance and rebalance the risk with this, uh, with this guarantee. Uh, also, um, there is a discussion, uh, there has been um, the so-called wise persons report on the financial um, development finance infrastructure in Europe, uh, because I think there is an understanding that we need to, uh, to focus all our inputs more. And uh, they were thinking of three different possibilities, whether to, I don't want to go into detail, but whether to look at the EBRD as a possible uh, institution that can be transformed into this, or a big bank where EBRD, EIB and Commission could create a new institution, or to create a subsidiary of the EIB that could be an institutional framework for, for, for something that metaphorically is a European um, uh, development investment bank, basically. Uh, in, in, and, the, and also we are now in the process of programming, which means that we are looking at the world and uh, designing sort of the basic, uh, the basic uh, ways in which uh, the pro programming will work. We are doing uh, mainstreaming of connectivity projects uh, across the world. But in, in making, and all these decisions will have to be done uh, more or less in 2020, uh, MFF for sure, and programming as well. Uh, for, the, for the bank, um, there might be a bit more, more time. But in making all these decisions, we have to keep a few things in mind. First, in order to be successful in connectivity, you have to have a scale. You have to have financial and technological scale. You have to be big. There are few powers that are big uh, at that level globally. European Union is certainly one of them, but only when we are all together. So for European Union, uh, togetherness is, is key. Uh, and Connectivity requires collaborative uh, uh, methodology. This is not something that any of our member states can do uh, fully alone. Uh, the second is that key to success as well is to tap into private, uh, private capital. We really need to do everything and find right ingredients to, in, uh, to, to, to sort of um, get private businesses and private capital much more interested in the developing markets to incentivize them, not only through the financial um, facilities, but also through thinking what is the enabling environment that can be an additional argument for our businesses to go there, whether it's regulatory, predictability, human resources, everything that is linked with, uh, with sound investment. Private investment is key. And finally, uh, connectivity is something that nobody in the world can do alone. Partnerships are needed by definition. So we have been engaging with a number of, of countries and partners. Uh, last September, we have concluded a connectivity partnership with Japan. We're now working on implementing that partnership. We hope to have some very concrete deliverables also by, uh, by the summit this year. Uh, this partnership, we can talk a bit more in detail later, but it, it has two known elements and two new. Uh, two known are 
principles. There is a full um, uh, agreement on the basic principles between EU and Japan when it comes to sustainable connectivity and quality infrastructure. And the second known are ongoing bilateral dialogues, be it on transport, on digital, on everything that we do bilaterally. And there are two novelties. Uh, one is that we have identified geographies where we want to work together. And in that, uh, in that uh, agreement is the Western Balkans, it's the Eastern neighborhood, it's Central Asia, is Africa and uh, Indo-Pacific region. And the second novelty is that we have also agreed that we will work together on further incentivizing private businesses uh, in going together in third markets. So we are looking at uh, both, if you wish, the conceptual or the philosophical side of connectivity, the policy side, but also the mechanics of it. Um, as I said, it's very complex. So what we are trying to do is find the most sort of user-friendly ways of explaining, but also utilizing what is in our, in our hands. Um, it's really not that we need anything extra. It's just that what we have, we have to combine and then use in the right, in the right way. Okay. Okay.